Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to start out tonight with George Barris, who died recently at the age of 89. George Barris was a custom car designer, but not any custom car designer. George Barris was the designer and builder of many of the famous Hollywood custom cars, especially the ones that you saw on television in the 60s. Most notably, the Beverly Hillbillies truck that Jed took the family out to Beverly Hills in, the Munster coach that the Munsters drove around in, and his most famous design, the 1966 Batmobile. George Barris is the man behind the Batmobile, and here he talks about it. My name is George Barris, and I'm here with probably the world's most famous automobile. Without a doubt, still number one after many, many decades, the famous television 1966 Batmobile. I'm proud to say that I was the designer and original builder of this automobile for a great television show with Dozier at 20th Century Fox called Batman. Adam West, Burt Ward, and many, many great, great stars. We had three weeks. When Dozier came to me with Bob Kane and Adam West, they said, what can you give us for the 20th century in 1966? With Dozier's concept of Batman with the pow and the bang and the wow, I had a big a car that would also go with the bings and the bangs and the same thing. We had to have rocket tubes. We had to have gas knobs. We had to have seat injectors to catch the Joker. We threw some oil out there so he would skid out. To catch the Riddler, we throw some nails out so it puncture his tires. Just to give you an idea of the crime-fighting implements that we had in the 60s compared to to now. Bob Kane had a Batman car way back in the 40s when he created the comic strip with a bat face cut out in the front of a Lincoln Zephyr. I said, I want to incorporate the bat features into the car, not just a plaque stuck onto it. So I made the, the ears into the fenders. I made the lights become the headlights. I made the nose become the chain slicer. The grill extended out and it became part of the front end. Then from there it flowed on back where I had the 15-foot bat fin fingers in the back, which had the splices and the double bubble we had for both Adam and Burt Ward. I locked the door shut, and I made Burt and Adam both jump over the doors and into the fenders so that they get inside the car, just to give you an idea of something, again, different. Made them very athletic. That means they were really the crime fighters. We had to incorporate the injector seats so that if somebody went to steal the car, they had the wrong key, the wrong word, and then they would push the wrong buttons, and we would just shoot them right out of the car. Of course, we elevated them with cables. Everything had to work because we didn't have the electronics and the computers and the special effects that give you illusion on the screens like you do today. We had to make them actually operate. That when you see the smoke, it was smoke. You seen the burner coming out of the back? Well, we didn't have the big force great flames. We used kerosene, an igniter, and a fan to blow out the exhaust flames. I was in a show in a town called Fargo, North Dakota, and we were doing a press media shot. And I'm driving down the street with the press people, and all of a sudden, wah, 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 and I pull over, and this guy gets out. He says, you have no windshield wipers on that car, and your taillights are not right. He says, I'm going to impound that car. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, officer. We're just doing a, a press shot for the TV, and, and I don't care what you're trying to say. He called the tow truck in, towed in the car, hauled me into the police station, and arrested me. We go before the judge, and the judge looks, and he looks at his officer, and he says, Wilbur, do you realize what you did? And he says, what do you mean? He said, you impounded the famous Batmobile, and you threw Mr. Barris in jail. He said, I'm going to demote you to a dog catcher. In reminiscing about the movie, it was kind of a lot of fun, because we had more time to make adaptions because this car weighs 6,000 pounds. That's three tons, to give you an idea of the difference in the weight. The engine, big old Ford. The car started out as an experimental Lincoln Futura. That's the first thing everybody asked me. What was it? Was it a Pontiac? Was it a T-Bird? Was it a Chevy? Experimental Lincoln Futura. That means it was a concept car. It was never a production car. We actually took the car from a scene called Started Without a Kiss with Debbie Reynolds and Glenn Ford. From there, from the three weeks I had to build the automobile, we created the Batmobile. We had to build five of them. The reason why is that each car had to do a different thing. The stunt car was number five car. It did all the chases and the jumps and all that. The number four car was the race car. That was the car that had drag racing scenes against our famous Green Hornet, Van Williams and Bruce Lee. The number three car was an executive car. 
It was the one that was used for exhibition. Number two car was a double for the number one car. Ferris also custom designed the monkey mobile for the monkeys, the 1928 Porter for my mother, the car. He customized a lot of cars for Hollywood celebrities, including a solid gold Rolls Royce for Zsa, Zsa Gabor. He's a legend in Hollywood. And by the way, he retained the rights to the Batmobile until January of 2013 when he sold it for $4.6 million. We're going to move on now to Helmut Schmidt, who died recently at the age of 96, one of the most important post-war politicians in Europe. He was Chancellor of West Germany from 1974 to 1982, and he was involved in some of the most important negotiations within Europe about the European Union, the common market, the currency, and military issues involving the Soviet Union. Here's Matthew Bannister on BBC4 Last Word, and among the people he talked to about Helmut Schmidt was Henry Kissinger. Helmut Schmidt was Chancellor of West Germany for eight years in the 1970s and 80s. A former defense minister and finance minister, he was in favor of rearmament and the need to counter the military threat from the Soviet Union, policies which were not always popular with left-wingers in his Social Democratic Party. Helmut Schmidt was born in Hamburg in 1918. Like other boys at his school, he joined the Hitler Youth and at the age of 18 was drafted into the Wehrmacht. In 1994, he was captured by British troops and held as a prisoner of war in Belgium for six months, a time which shaped his socialist beliefs. Let me say a word on the European uh, community also. You know... Being a European politician is not at all that difficult because all you have to do is to satisfy the farmers, satisfy the trade unions, satisfy a few other groups and still get elected, you know. I cannot totally avoid to put myself into the position of a man who in front of ladies and gentlemen belonging to the Salvation Army tries to convince them of the advantages of drink. I asked the former British Foreign Secretary, Lord Owen, He's credited as having been the joint architect of the European monetary system with Giscard d'Estaing. Is that a fair credit? Yes, I think it was. And I think one of my disagreements with him, and I think really pretty objectively one criticism, is he has stuck to that resolutely and has utterly refused, really, to accept that it has any flaws in it, when it's pretty apparent to everybody that it has major flaws. Helmut was a man... Of conviction. The former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was a good friend of Helmut Schmidt. He was really not somebody for small talk. At the same time, drew you in a circle of being engaged in a common enterprise. Were there particular issues that you had to deal with him about on the political stage? At first, the relationship of nuclear weapons to the defense of a Europe it felt itself threatened by a possible Soviet invasion. My attitude is that our joint Western policy of the time uh, can only be pursued under the precondition that we firmly maintain the balance of military power and military security. One of Helmut Schmidt's biggest military challenges came when a Lufthansa plane carrying 86 passengers was hijacked to Mogadishu in Somalia. The Chancellor ordered the storming of the plane by German commandos and all the hostages were safely rescued. But Henry Kissinger says Schmidt was very aware of what might have happened if the raid had gone wrong. Schmidt was in enormous anguish about what the fate of these people would be. And afterwards he commented to me how he would react if he had to make the decision to have nuclear weapons used in his own country. He was absolutely firm on defense when the Soviet Union started to deploy SS-20s, that that had to be matched for negotiating purposes with American cruise missiles and Pershing. And remember, that was actually eventually a very successful negotiation. The SS-20s were withdrawn, and the Pershing and cruise missiles went as well. So it was a very successful stance, and he was the one who saw the necessity of it when he was Chancellor. And, and the great cost to his own personal position, because I believe that that was really the, the root of his downfall. Yes, well, downfalls one way, he had a good innings. He was a staunch ally of the United States of Europe, but you could not prove that every day by what he said, because he had a grumpy side. Would he sometimes be critical of U.S. policy? Would he sometimes ring up and, and try to change the way things were going when you were in power? Sometimes would not be the correct word. I Often. Quite frequently. 
Uh, and you obviously took his advice seriously. I took his advice very seriously. He criticised me from time to time when I was arguing for things he didn't want, but I actually negotiated a deal with him on the back of an envelope in Buckingham Palace, which ended the German payments over three years to us for keeping the British forces on the Rhine. And he had absolutely no size. So you literally did it on the back of an envelope? Yes, I had the envelope for years. I, I much regret losing it. It must have been intellectually stimulating to spend the evening with him. Did he also play music for you? Because he was a wonderfully accomplished pianist, wasn't he? He was a wonderfully accomplished pianist. I associated him most with Mozart. Later in life, he became deaf, of course, and so he couldn't hear the music anymore. But he had this strange relationship to music that he could look at a piece of music and hear it by reading it. He would read it off the page, even though he couldn't hear it. He was an incessant smoker. At one of his birthday parties, I said, that he made a contribution to medical science by proving that four packs of cigarettes and 20 cokes a day would ensure longevity. Not only did he smoke constantly, but he used to use snuff. And I was one of the last people I've ever known who was uh, using snuff. And of course, he's not PC at all. I think it's one of the reasons the Germans still love him, really. Is that he used to insist on going with the cigarettes to the television studios in an ashtray. Of course, as a doctor, I strongly disapprove of that. My other side of me says, bravo. Hey, I'm not alone in making mistakes on these podcasts. Even the BBC makes them. The British captured Helmut Schmidt in 1944, not 1994. We're going to close tonight with Melissa Matheson, who died recently at the age of 65. She was a well-known Hollywood screenwriter. She was also married to Harrison Ford for 21 years until they got divorced, and he took up with Callista Flockhart. When I was working with Harrison Ford, he told me a good story about him, Melissa Matheson, and Hillary Clinton, but I can't tell it on this podcast. Anyway, Melissa Matheson was a West Coast girl born in L.A. She hung around with those Northern California guys, you know, Coppola and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. She wrote the screenplay for The Black Stallion. She wrote some of the screenplay for the Twilight Zone movie. She did a couple other things before she left the business for a while to raise her children. She wrote the movie Kundun about the Dalai Lama, big hitter the Lama. But hey, who are we kidding? Melissa Matheson is best known because she was the writer and creator of E.T. the Extraterrestrial. She and Spielberg turned it into a film classic and one of the biggest grossing movies of all time. It took eight weeks for us to get the first draft, which was quite fast, I think. I was just knocked out. I, I, it, was, it was a script that I was willing to shoot tomorrow. I, I didn't really want to do a lot with it. It was honest, and it was right from both of our hearts, but Melissa's voice made a direct connection with my heart. Hey, you know what? That's not a bad legacy to close on. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And what else can we close with tonight? But the flying thing from E.T. by John Williams. He won all sorts of awards for this. Oscar, BAFTA, Grammy. Definitely one of the greatest movie themes of all time. Here he is with Spielberg working on it. If it would be convenient to go into the call. Yeah. I like that. It, it, it seems like a very natural transition yeah. into the loneliness and out of the, uh, the tenderness. And here is a final tribute to Melissa Matheson is the finished product. <laughs> <laughs>